Amen and amen. You may be seated. This chapter begins with a statement that men ought always to pray and not be weak and weary. Men ought always to pray and not be weak and weary. Of course, this chapter begins with the story of the unjust judge who had no interest, with it, interest in God, but a woman came to him and he said, you know, it's within my power and it's within my right and it's within my ability to do what this woman needs me to do. And unless I do it, she's going to just keep coming to me and I'll be weary with her coming. So since I have the power and since I have the ability and since I have the understanding, I just don't want to mess with her anymore. So I'm just going to give her what she wants. Then he goes on to say, now isn't God, isn't God, uh, I just clicked it or she clicked it, I guess maybe. Uh, he said, do you hear what the unjust judges said concerning the continual coming to him for an answer of which he knew that he had the means to provide? But then Jesus speaks concerning this in verse 7. And he said, shall not God avenge his elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? In other words, will he not commit to, will he not be content with, and will he not continue to deal with his people without any delay? This has been an interesting week for me. It's been an interesting weekend for me. Uh, Sharon is not with us today because she is, uh, even as we speak, I want you to say this as loud as you can. Can you? We're going to say, hi, Sharon, and hi, Mom. Are you ready? Say it loud. Hi, Sharon, and hi, Mom. Well, on Friday, I was playing golf, and I got a phone call that I missed, and so I called my wife back, and my mother had taken an accident in her home. And Sharon said, we don't, I don't know what's wrong. I just know she called and said she has hurt herself. So we ran quickly to get there. I was further away, of course, than Sharon. And uh, when Sharon arrived, she found her covered in... Uh, bottles of medication, all kinds of things because she fell in the bathroom. And so when I arrived, she had no movement in her left side. Her left leg was stuck underneath her. She was sitting in a pretzel on the floor and it did, just didn't look good. And I said, can you move it all? And she said, can't move my left leg. Can you move your right leg? Yeah, I can, but it hurts my left leg. So we waited three and a half hours for EMS to come and get my 98-year-old mother up off the floor. And so it wasn't their fault. Within two miles of our house, there were two major uh, incidences that provided them with a real overload. And when they did get there, they said they had already, they were working on their ninth hour. And we appreciate all that they did to comfort her and get her where she needed to go and she wound up having to be used twice uh used them twice so anyway when we arrived there she was and all we had to do there was nothing we could do we were just stuck sitting on a porcelain floor in pain so we went to prayer so we went to prayer. That's what we did. And I laid hands on her, and we prayed. And we waited, and we prayed. And so 
I said, Mom, can you move your left leg? She said, no. And I said, well, what do we do? We pray. So we continued to pray. And finally, after an hour and a half, Sharon said, we've got to put her in a better position. So we made some nursing adjustments. Sharon knew, thank God for Sharon. She saved my life, and she probably went very far to saving my mother's life. And uh, I want to tell you that, that how God preserves. She fell with a toilet to her right and a bathtub to her left, behind her rather, in such a fashion that she, she wound up hitting the door. She missed everything that could have, could have. The Holy Spirit laid her back in a fashion that all of the, the danger of falling, except falling on her hip, was eliminated. So we moved her out and finally got her placed in a position and propped up and, and she sighed and um, she said, ah, and I said, what's wrong? She said, there's a little bit of a pain relief. So we waited about another hour and a half and EMS finally came and they got her in the truck and about 6.15 or so, we made it to the hospital. They put her through various uh, tests and so forth and so on and came in uh, uh, and said, we'll just wait to see what the people, the orthopedic people here say. So about 10.15, 10 10.30, 10 uh, I was sitting trying my best on a chair that is very uncomfortable to put my head down, and I heard something kicking. You know how it sounds when you kick sheets. It, whoosh, whoosh. And I looked up expecting her to be moving her right leg, and I saw her kicking her left leg. Well, that happens to be the hip that was injured. Forgot to tell you that at one point while we, after we moved her, she called me and said, I need you to pray for me again. And so we did. And at that time, she was in a position where we could reach right out and lay hands directly upon the hip. And so we did. By 10, 15 or 10, 30, I saw her kicking her left hip. I said, Mom, you probably ought to stop that. Within another 15 minutes, I saw her raising her hips up off the bed like this right here. And I said, Mom, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm trying to position my hips. So she's kicking her left leg. She's raising a hip that they have already told us has a bro the wing is broken. That has a ball and socket that has a crack in the socket. So they came in and told us that they were going to take her to Wake Baptist because she needed a trauma surgeon. That doesn't sound good. And so they put us in the, van, in, the, in the thing, and we went over to Wake Baptist, and there we sat for another four hours. She laid flat on a gurney in a neck brace for four solid hours at 98 years old. Now, I have to tell you, there was one time, only once, during this now... Two o'clock in the afternoon to four o'clock in the morning, Odyssey, where she said anything other than, I'm okay, I'm all right. She said, are they ever going to do anything for me here? That's what she said. I'd like for them to take this neck brace off. She tugged and pulled on that neck brace and she said, ain't nothing wrong with my neck. <laughs> They said, well, it could be because you fell and you've hurt your hip. So about 4 o'clock, they rolled us into ICU, and I finally got to talk to a doctor, and they said she had a pool of blood in the hip area, and that if it was a bleed, they would have to do surgery to stop that bleed because that bleed is what causes you to go septic. And you know I am that person. I went septic because of an internal bleed. And so... Uh, I went home that night, left her in ICU, and uh, called back the next morning. And the woman said, 
Oh, you mean Miss Irma? I said, yeah. She said, she's such a delightful person. And I said, I know, she's a wonderful person. She's just doing great. She's the light of the ICU. Everybody loves Miss Irma. I said, well, how is she doing? Well, she's sitting up. She wants some coffee. And she seems to be doing fine. And I said, well, what are they going to do for her? They said, well, they're not going to do anything. The blood situation has solved itself. The doctors and physicians say they don't feel like there's any surgery they're going to want to do. Uh, I said, if what's her pain? Well, she says she's not in any pain. Glory to God. So I called back this morning on the way to church, and the lady said to me, your mom's doing great. We think we're going to move her. I said, what's her pain? She doesn't have any pain. She said, as a matter of fact, we just got her up and she bore her own weight and walked. And now she's sitting in a recliner, 98 years old, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I want to tell you, and I want to tell all of those of you phony preachers out there that tell me that God doesn't move and God doesn't hear and God doesn't heal, and God doesn't do any of the things that He used to do, you are a liar. I've watched it in the last 48 hours with my own eyes. God is still sitting on the throne, and God is still answering and avenging His elect in this very moment, and this very day, and this very hour, and because you don't have any hope, I have all the hope in Him who is, and who was, and who is to come. He is the Lord, the God that changes not. Glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I'm telling you, He is the avenger of those who cry day and night. Now, when I look into this thing that I'm preaching about today, I don't have my what you might call it, but I want you to see this. We are the ones who are responsible to continue to approach God. We are the ones who are responsible for bringing our needs continually before Him. He is the one that is responsible for our ability for us when we come to Him, for Him to avenge our needs, to contend without delay on our needs. Now, someone would say to me, Pastor, many people, many people would say to you, well, I've tried that, and whenever I needed it, it didn't happen to me. Oh, really? Oh, really? Is that the case? All right, now, I want you to think about this just a second. When you were in the depths of your despair, if you're still listening under the sound of my voice, what happened? Huh. If you're still hearing me preach this message, what happened? Why are you still here if God didn't answer? Why are you still here if God didn't make a way? Why are you still here if God is not operating in the same vein from the plan of salvation and the blood of Jesus Christ? Why are you still floating? Why do you still have your life above ground today? If God is not still blessing and keeping and honoring His Word, then why are you still here? Yeah, we all we could go around this room today and say, well, I was involved, I had this. For me, I had cancer. I had a ripped esophagus bleeding internally that caused my body to go into a septic, a septic situation. My whole body be turned, but I'm still here. I could go into you. There's, there's, there is kidney relief, there is heart relief, 
There is heart relief. There is kidney relief. There is a relief from all of the amenities of problems in life. Whatever the case may be, you are still here, and the reason for it is the God of glory has been faithful to his word. He is the avenger of the elect. He is the deliverer of his people. He is the one who has shed his blood so that you could live. Glory to God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He is still the healer. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Let's read that. Seeing then. Now, do you see that word? Seeing then. Seeing then. What is he talking about? He has just told you that you have a high priest. He has just told you about a Jesus. Now watch the word of God. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, you have, my friends, a high priest. Now, you notice that I have focused on the name Jesus Christ, Lord God. And I've not spent a whole lot of time talking about him in the office of high priest. Well, in the office of high priest, you have a man who has passed into the heavens who is called Jesus, the Son of God, who allows you, affords you, because of who he is, the ability to hold fast your words, your profession, that gives you the things that the lying preachers of this world want to tell you because they don't experience it. They don't understand it. They don't seek it. They don't want it. But the truth of the matter is that there is a profession that you need to hold on to because in it comes your hope and your confidence. If you ain't got no hope, or like my old football player said, if you ain't got none, you can't have none. If you don't have any hope, if you don't have any confidence in who God is and in what God is doing, you just won't have any. You just won't have any. The, they have told us today that the Bible is only good for you being able to believe and have faith in the fact God has saved you. Now, I want you to consider that for just a second. Now, I want you to consider this salvation of which you say you believe, which we know. I, I believe in all my heart. There's not a lost person in this congregation. There may be a lost person that's living uh, out there in camera land, but there's not a person in here that doesn't know Christ. I want to tell you what you say you believe, okay? You say that you believe that Jesus Christ came through a virgin without a man as his father. Now, I want you to consider what faith that takes because there ain't a person in here that didn't have a mommy and a daddy that was a flesh and blood. So you say that you believe that God moved through the Holy Spirit upon Mary and Mary was birthed with a baby and that baby <laughs> was Jesus Christ who was the Son of Man. He was the Son of God. He is the priest. He is the prophet and he is the king. You believe all of that, don't you? Very simple. And you believe that as he lived this life, that he showed the world the Father. Now, what about the Father did he show them? He showed them that the Father would operate in signs and wonders and miracles, didn't he? When did the Father change? What caused the Father to do different? Jesus came into this world to show mankind that the Father was still operating in the same way he had always operated for Israel. He was showing the people the same. But wait a minute, Pastor. Didn't he show it to the Gentiles as well? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because he did. There was the little woman whose daughter, when, she, when he was out traveling the roads, came to him 
And he said, she said uh, to her, my daughter's sick. And he said, uh, you, you can't eat the bread of the fathers. And she said, no, but we can have the crumbs off the ground. You remember that? And Jesus healed her daughter. Yeah. And then he said, said that she had faith. She had used faith. And then there was the centurion. What about the centurion? He was a Gentile. He was a man who simply walked in faith. He lived in faith. And how do we know that? Because Jesus said so. He said, I ain't seen such great faith in Israel. He said they came to him and asked him to minister to the man because he had been good to the Jews. Jesus said, I'll do it. In the middle of it came the little woman who reached out to touch the hem of his garment. She got healed because she reached out to him in a very bad situation. What did she do? What did she touch? She touched the borders in blue. What do they represent? They represent him as high priest. And then she said, he said to Jesus, you just speak the word. You don't have to come where I, my, my child is. You, my servant is. You just speak the word. And Jesus said, I have not seen such great what? Faith. No, not in Israel. You see, faith has always been the avenue that allows men to be able to touch God. Now, here's the problem. And the problem is that we want to be a part of a moment. We live to be a part of a moment. Now, get me here. When the moment arises that we need to go to God over some crisis, over some sickness, over some problem in our life, we live in that moment. We live in the moment. We are there. It is a moment in time where we realize our weakness and we go to God because of His strength. Now, I want to tell you why. Many people don't get healed, and there it is. We live for a moment. We live for a moment. Whenever we can call on God because we all of a sudden recognize the need for God. Now, God has already said that he would operate his word, and his word would act speedily, and that he would avenge those who cry to him, listen, day and night. And he would bear along with those who cry to him day and night. Now remember, in this story in Luke 18, there is the unjust judge who has all of the ability and all of the power to provide whatever is needed and required. And only out of his desire to not be wearied did he choose to provide it. God is saying, God, Jesus is saying, God's not like that, friend. Not only is he not like that, he has the ability and the desire to provide for you whatever it is you need, whenever you need it. And the writer of the book of Hebrews said so when he said, Jesus Christ ain't changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same, doing the same work operating the same way, giving us the same answers, showing us the same word of God, living in the same power, doing the exact same things now that he did then or else he's a liar. Now the problem is, is that we live in a moment. Notice what the scripture said. The scripture said, I will avenge them who do not live in a moment. They don't live in a moment. They don't live for a moment. They don't live for the moment whenever they're sick, when they're hurt, when they're undone, when they're in trouble, when they're in persecution, whenever things aren't going right, when there's a marital issue, whenever a child is falling away from them, whenever they can see rebellion, whenever they can see that something is going in a way that they cannot seem to find within their own intellect to fix or change, they don't live for that moment. Because in that moment, it's whenever they try to go to God. In that moment, is whenever they try to conjure up a 
relationship with God. And say, now, God, you know me. You know I've been in the house of God every time the doors were open. You know that I've listened to the word of God. You know that I've been there. I've supported. I have done all of the things. You know me, God. Now, God, you give me what it is I'm asking you for. Because I know you're capable. Isn't that what the woman did with the unjust judge? She said, now, I know you're able. I know you're capable, but Jesus qualified that in verse 7. He said, he will avenge those who are continually crying, who are continually looking to me day and night and hour by hour, who are continually coming into my presence. Those are the ones that I'm going to bear with, and those are the ones that I'm going to bless, and those are the ones that are going to hear the answer. Not those who live for a moment, but those who live consistently in the moment. See, there's a difference, friend. There's a difference there. We can live by our intellect until we come to the, the, the edge and the barrier and say, well, I can't go any further because I can't understand how to get from here to there. Or we can live continually in the moment with Jesus Christ and Paul said that we could walk in the Spirit why? Because he is in the Spirit. We can walk with him and talk with him. He can be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He can be the light source of light that gives us peace in every moment and be under the shadow of his wings where he becomes our shield, our buckler, and our fortress. We can live there. Glory to God. But people don't want to do that. Why? Because it takes work. It takes an investment of time. People would say to me, but pastor, I have this, that, and the other to do. Let me tell you. I stood and looked in the floor at a 98-year-old woman sitting on the floor in a pretzel in a position I ain't so sure I could get in. Laying on Lenora tile, a tile floor, and then laying down for almost four hours. I walked into the room at Wake Forest Baptist and I saw this same woman who could not be laid flat between two and six because the pain was too, too deep. Laying flat on a gurney, immobilized, totally immobilized, 98 years old. I asked myself the question, how is she doing this? And I would repeatedly say to her, Mom, are you okay? Yes. Mom, are you feeling okay? Yes. Mom, are you breathing okay? Yes. How are you doing this? How could this be? Then my mind goes back. My mind goes back to when I was a child. And when I was a child, I was very scared at night because I couldn't breathe. At night times, I just couldn't breathe. It was like the, the room would close in around me and I couldn't breathe. And I would get up and run down the hall and I'd run into my bedroom, her bedroom, and I would say, Mom, what, son? Will you pray for me? And that little bony hand, not much bigger than it is today, would reach out of bed and lean, reach it over and lay it on my head. And she would pray. In the middle of the night, when she got done, she would drop her hand and she would say, Now, honey, listen, go back to bed and go to sleep. Now, what do you suppose I did? 
I never thought anymore about breathing. I never thought anymore about how scared I was because a woman of God had laid her hand on me and said, go back to bed and go to sleep. And guess what I did? I went back to bed and I went to sleep. Got up the next morning and ran at 100 miles an hour until the next day and everybody would have thought, boy, how could he not sleep tonight after all that he's done and probably the next night or two I was back in her. And you know it always amazed me because it never seemed like I had to wake her up. It never seemed like I walked in where she was groggy. Now as she has gotten older, I have questioned her on these things, and this is what I found out. She said, oh, I sleep a little bit, and I pray a while. Oftentimes, I pray and think it's going to put me to sleep, and it doesn't. She said, so about 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning, I just get up and start my day. I said, well, what do you do then? She said, well, I get me a cup of coffee. I go in. I sit down with the Word of God. I begin to read the Word of God. And then the Holy Spirit will begin to show me things. And she's got literal stacks of writing. Stacks. I've got stacks at home. She told me last night, now, son... You are going to really be interested in this last writing I just did. I would have finished it Friday, but of course I'm in here. She said, it's on work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and you're going to see some things in there that's going to bless you. I'll guarantee you, whenever I get home, I'll finish it so you'll have it. Now I'm talking about why this thing doesn't work for people. I'm talking about why people lose their hope. I'm talking about will I find faith. That's the title of my message. And I'm telling you that whenever I looked at her on the floor, my spirit had no problems. My spirit had no problems. My sister asked me how did it feel and I couldn't answer. All I could do was do what I knew to do. And that was pray. All I could do was do what I'd do for you. And that was pray. All I could do was call on the God in whom I have believed. So it did. She did the same thing. But in the moment of which we were, it was not the moment. It was not a moment. It was not derived from a moment of needing God. It was derived from a life of studying the Word of God, of living in the Scripture, of walking in hope, of believing with confidence that what God said He would do, He would do, of understanding the truth of the revelation of who God was, and of believing upon believing, and knowing upon knowing that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, sir. So we weren't there just in a moment of need. We weren't there stuck without hope. No, we, we were exercising. We were in the same moments that we have been in for years. That we have walked in for years that I stood up and preached my daddy's funeral from because the Lord had engulfed me with the ability to look at people and say, I preached all over the world and I have believed and told people in funerals that if you believe there is a better place, there is a better time, there is a better eternity than we have here, and I would be a liar to stand before you and be devastated by the loss of my dad. And I would be a liar to stand before you and say I was devastated by the loss of my brother. Was I hurt? Yes. But was I devastated? I was not in trouble. 
And I was not in trouble on Friday either, let me tell you, neither was she. We're not in trouble, my friend, whenever we simply say that. I have to tell you this. I was writing this week, and the Word of God came to me, and I began to, to, to say something that I did not understand in my writing. And it is a writing on, on Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 4, and I did not understand what was being said, but I was saying it out of my own mind. And I heard myself say, Father, if I live, I live to you. If I continue to be of service, I will be of service to you. When the day comes that you need me, I'm ready. I have no attachments to this world. I have no reason to say I want to live to be 98 or 103. There's nothing about this world that has an allurement for me that would say to me I would rather be here than to be in my eternal home with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and join around the throne to sing that great song, Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. We'll crown Him now with many crowns. He reigns victorious. High and lifted up. No, I don't need to be there, but if you want me there, I'll be glad to go. I have no attachment to this world. I have no reason to say that I must be here. But God, if you choose to leave me, I'm writing these words and don't know why. Then the word of the God of God took me to Paul's writing where Paul said, I'm in a straight betwixt two. I want to go be with you, but you seem to need me here. And they seem to need me here. So therefore, I'll stay here until the day comes when you need me. Now I'm standing on Saturday morning. Preparing to go to the hospital. And I heard the Spirit of God say to me, You need to tell me what you're willing to do with your mother. I said, what? Then he brought me back to what I had written on that very week. And I said, well, God, I love my mother. She's been the stability of my life. Spiritually, as a mother, she's been my stable. When I needed help, when I needed encouragement, when I needed direction, when I needed instruction, do you know she was never short to look me in the eye and tell me the truth no matter how much I didn't want to hear it? I said, God, if you need her, if she's done here, you take her with you. I'm satisfied with that. I'm totally satisfied with that. She's lived all of her life, preached the gospel all over the country, been a faithful witness, been on radio and television. God, if her chore is passed here, take her on. I give her to you. Yeah, I give her to you. I said, God, but if it's not, if there's still a testimony that she can produce, if there's still a word of God that she can give, and you choose to leave her, we will love her. We will take care of her. We'll do our best by her. You make the choice. I surrender her to you. I finished and got dressed, went in, got some food and sat down. I said, well, I better call. And that's when they began to tell me, oh, now, wait a minute. She's doing great. She's doing wonderful. She's sitting up. She's eating. She's laughing. She's witty. She's in her right mind. There I am. Now how could I do that, folks? How could that occur? Because it wasn't being just for a moment. Because in the moment, I should have been crying in tears. My whole family should have been crying in tears. Do you know that not one of us said anything more than, let's pray. Call my sister. I'm praying. My sister called my nephew. We're praying. See, 
The reason people don't get out of this thing what it is that the Word of God has promised is because we live, we live for a moment. What God's Word is saying to you that we must live in the moment all the time. He said, now watch what the Word said. I didn't say it. I, I'm, I'm not that smart. I wish I had been that smart. I am fairly smart as far as the books go. There are things I cannot do. If there were all the things that I could do, uh, like Joey can do, this would have never happened. But God had a message in it because all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. So I wish there were things that I could do that I cannot do, but the Bible said, that He is avenging His elect. He is avenging those who continually cry day and night. Do you see that? Now, what are you telling me, Pastor? And I'm closing. I'm telling you that in your life, you have two options. You have the option to get caught up in the distractions that the enemy brings before you. You, get, you have the option to get caught up in how you feel. That'll be a big thing. How you feel will be a big thing. Because your body is always going to... There was a, there was a, a, a guy that, that was caught up in how he felt. Uh, and I talked to my sister about uh, her husband and how he felt just, uh, just a few months before he died and, and, and hollering for help and stuff. And, and people will get caught up in how they feel. Or, the other option is to get caught up in the spirit world and to walk with Him and talk with Him. Do you notice that Adam and Eve never talked about looking at their nakedness until they got caught up in the distraction? Then how they felt and how they looked became very important to them. But prior to that, they walked with God in the cool of the day. Their spirit man and his spirit man had total unison. But then they got distracted, and when they got distracted, they fell out, and now they're looking around about them and seeing everything that could bring them away from the walk in the cool of the day. And it was so absolutely uh, inundating that they didn't show up at the cool of the day. They were so distracted that they didn't show up. That was the first indicator to God. Something went wrong. He said, Adam, where art thou? And what have you done? The first indicator is always going to be that you're looking around at the distractions of this life and the cares of this life. You remember the broadcasting of the Word of God where the, where the Word of God fell in three out of four places and it took no root because there was always some distraction there to snatch it away. But we live in a life, my friend, where we have the ability in the spirit man to make a choice. Someone said, oh, pastor, you know, I haven't done well with this. Then start today. Start now. Start living in the moment now. Start correcting yourself now. Start doing things differently now. God is a God that has provided a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. He has gone into the tabernacle and sprinkled the blood so that you could pick up where you are now and build a relationship with Him. Now, look at verse 15. I'm going to be done. For we have a high priest which cannot be touched, which, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of your infirmities. That means He's still waiting on you to lay down your distractions and simply come to Him. If you do, He will take your infirmities. Look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come. When is that? That is right now. That is this moment. That is at this second right here. Now what's going to happen if you come for this moment and don't walk in it? You'll be back in the same boat you were before. I heard a guy say the other day, you know, I listen to these faith healers and they get people to be healed and a week later they ain't healed no more. Well, right, there's your answer. They came, they saw it, and they stayed in it for a moment. They didn't live in it. They didn't make it the moment in which they lived to walk hand in hand with God. 
They made it for the moment when the man who was full of faith and could touch God and allow God to use him could lay hands on them and the power of God would minister. Then they would go back out and get into them, what? Cells. And now all of a sudden it doesn't work and people say, God, don't do it that way no more. That's a lie. That's a lie. People don't live in that way that they should anymore. See? Look at the word. Let us therefore come boldly. When? Now. Into the throne of grace. Into the throne of grace. What are we going to find? We're going to find favor. We're going to find merit. We're going to find the influence of God. We're going to find the way God does things. We're going to find the open heaven of judgment whereby the promises of God that are in Christ Jesus are produced and provided for everyone who will come to the throne of God. That's the word of God. That we may obtain mercy. Find grace to help in time of need. So whatever grace level you're requiring, it's all in there. All you got to do is get out of this thing of walking for a moment and get into this thing of walking in the moment, step by step, day by day, hour by hour, and living under the influence of the Spirit of God. Now, my mother said, and I'm going to close with these words before you bow your head. You need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Bow your head and close your eyes. Father, we thank you for the word of God today. Now is the moment. Now is the time. Now is the opportunity. When all of those that are sitting and listening under the sound of my voice who have heard the miracle of signs and wonders that God has wrought in the life of a woman who has been faithful, in the life of a woman who has understood what it is to live in the wisdom and knowledge and understanding of God, and how that Spirit has been revealed to her and touched and ministered to her body. Now, Father, as we live in this now moment, as we choose the opportunity to live in the now and to take ourselves into the throne room of God and find grace and find mercy that will minister in every moment in which we remain in you. In all of those moments, in all of those hours, in all of those days, as we walk in the Spirit of God by the power of God with our eyes firmly placed on the prize, as we live in that, from this moment forward, we ask you to illumine our lives with the light of healing, with the light of love, with the light of life, with the light of power, with the light of the angels of God who are sent for the express purpose of ministering for us. So whatever our ministry that we are requiring in the throne room of God, the angels of God are being sent to minister the very needs that we have for us. If we will walk and if we will remain, and if we will live in the light as He is in the light, then we will have fellowship with the light. And that light will bring us the ability to find and obtain our mercy and our grace in all times of needs, in every hour of the day, now, if you agree with me and you're willing to receive that today, I want you to stand to your feet. Give him some praise. Father, we thank you today. We worship you today. We honor you today. We love you today. We give you praise and honor and glory for your faithfulness. God, you have been faithful. How faithful you have been. 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 You have been. Now, I want you to recall the times when he has been faithful to you. Do you remember the time 
when your little girl needed a kidney and God was faithful. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Do you remember the time when you needed a place to stay and God was faithful? Isn't that right? When you needed a time for God to touch you in your liver and God was faithful. When you needed a time to God to touch you in your kidney and God was faithful. When you needed a new place to live and God was faithful. When you needed ministry to your finances and God was faithful. When you needed ministry and understanding the revelation of giving and truth and God was faithful. When you needed a time when God would touch you in your heart and God was faithful. When you needed a time for God to touch your family and God was faithful. When you needed a time for God to touch you in your heart and God to build up a business God was faithful when you needed a time for God to heal your knees and give you the ability to retire God was faithful when you needed a time for a place to live that was safe and great when you needed a touch in your body God was faithful when you needed a touch in your shoulder God was faithful when you needed a job God was faithful when you needed a kidney God was faithful when you needed business God was faithful wherever we have been. God has been faithful. Amen? God has been faithful. Walk in Him. For He is faithful. For He is faithful. He is God and He changes not. Give the Lord a hand clap of prayer. Father, I thank you for your people. Those of you that are listening on YouTube, Facebook, Lift Him Higher Radio, uh, Mike Springston, FFC, uh, I want to tell you today, you heard the Word of God. God is faithful. He'll be faithful to you. He'll deliver you. He'll give you peace. He'll set you on a path. If you will but walk with Him and work out your own salvation, God will minister. If you're lost today, pray with me. Forgive me my sins, Father. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I accept that. And I make Him Lord of my life. If today you're standing in need, if you have heard this message today, you know that God is faithful. Turn to Him. Allow the plan of salvation to minister to the core of your need. To the core of your need. And He will. He will. He loves you and He cares for you. And I challenge you today to walk in the Spirit of God and walk with Him. For He will manifest Himself and bless you. Don't be in a moment. Don't just live for a moment when you're crying out to God. But look at Luke 18 and 7 and find out that He avenges those who cry day and night. Who are continually with Him. Walk in the name of Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We thank you, God, for ministry. Thank you for your attendance today. May the Word of God and the Word of life, the Spirit of life and power that is in Jesus Christ go with you. May you be uplifted and encouraged. May the presence of God always surround you as you live in His glorious name. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.